The Resident Evil franchise has been around for nearly three decades, and in that time we have been introduced to a ton of bioorganic weapons. With the ever-growing RE enemy bank containing so many obscure and fascinating antagonists, Cameron and I have taken it upon ourselves to document every single one found in the mainline titles. Last time we covered RE0, so moving in chronological order, we will be taking a look at Resident Evil and its remake for today's video. I want to highlight crimsonhead.com and projectumbrella.net as the sources for this video. Both websites are dedicated to archiving and translating RE history, and they do great work. Now let's jump into it, cause Jill's getting impatient. To kick things off, we'll start with the most common enemy in the game, the zombie. The zombies in RE are infected with an updated strain of the T-virus that spread rampant in RE0. Labeled the Epsilon strain, this variant can further mutate a zombie into a crimson head. The T-virus was developed by Umbrella to create weapons for the military. Despite its intended use, the virus did not make these zombies viable for military application, as they could not be controlled. A zombie's greatest weakness appears to be a simple set of stairs. The evolution into a crimson head takes place when the corpse of a defeated zombie isn't properly disposed of. But just how do you dispose of a zombie properly? Well, you do what you would normally do with any dead body. Remove the head and or light it on fire. Some researchers within Umbrella theorize that the Crimson Head is the middle evolution between a zombie and a liquor. However, this theory may have been debunked because no Crimson Head mutations take place in future RE entries. They have very sharp claws and can run as fast as the player. As the name implies, they have reddish skin. This is due to a process known as V-Act. V-Act is when a zombie's heart begins to pump uncontrollably fast which causes blood to seep through the skin and stain it, as well as making their eyes glow white. It does not take long for a zombie to be reborn as a crimson head, so you better dispose of that body or face the consequences. What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! After collecting all of the death masks, you'll face a crimson head in the form of a boss fight. Known as Crimson Head Prototype 1, this boss is the first account of the V-Act process mutating a zombie into a crimson head. At this stage of research on T. Epsilon, very little was known about the effects of the virus on humans, so the victim was locked away to be studied. After a catastrophic failure attempting to feed the monster, four people were killed, and the decision was made to cease testing. Fearing the ferocity of the creature, it was locked away in a coffin and placed within the graveyard behind the Spencer Mansion. Becoming part of the mansion's intruder defense system, any unauthorized personnel attempting to access the Umbrella Lab would have to come face to face with the Proto Crimson Head. During its time cooking in the graveyard, Prototype 1 mutated further than the toddler Crimson Heads found throughout the game. This makes it appear with a more vibrant red skin tone and able to sustain more damage. As an exclusive enemy to the remake, the Crimson Head Prototype 1 has 2,300 HP against Jill and 5,600 HP against Chris. Cerberuses, Crows, and Hunter Alphas are present here like in RE0, which we've already covered, so here's a fast rundown. The Cerberus was created by injecting the T-Virus into a Doberman. Umbrella chose the Doberman to experiment on due to their high obedience and agility. The infection led to skin deterioration, which exposed the muscles and bones of these puppers. When a pack of Cerberi escaped the Arclay lab, they attacked and mauled several hikers, leading to a STARS investigation, which kicked off the events of RE1 and Zero. Subsequently, their decayed skin paired with their bloodlust would be the root cause of how the virus made its way down to Raccoon City. Next, crows are simply crows that were infected by the T-virus leading only to increased aggression. And to round it out, we have the Hunter Alpha. Created by William Birkin, alphas are the result of using the T-virus to perfectly combine reptilian DNA with human embryos. 
hunters also seem to suffer from a weakness to the mighty staircase. More of a puzzle element than an actual enemy, next up we have the monster plant. This plant is the resulting mutation from taking in T-virus infected water. It is immobile and attacks the player with its large vines if they get too close. In order to safely pass by it, the player must water it with herbicide, killing the plant instantly. The final enemy encountered in the mansion is the giant snake, codenamed Yawn. The name likely comes from how wide the snake can open its mouth. While the player will find many infected normal size adders around the outside of the mansion, this is the only one to have grown 40 feet in length. Like most Umbrella experiments, it became too large and aggressive to control, now roaming the mansion hunting unsuspecting prey. One such victim was Star's Bravo team member, Richard Aiken. It was a huge snake and also poisonous. Ugh. In addition to Yon's size, the potency of its poison has been significantly increased. If the player is poisoned by Yon, they will need a special serum to cure themselves. There are two boss encounters with Yan. In between encounters, Yan's poison has inexplicably gone away and is unable to poison the player on the second encounter. If bitten by normal adders, the player simply needs to use a blue herb. Hopefully you've properly managed your resources. The first enemy we are introduced to outside of the mansion is Lisa Trevor. Exclusive to the remake, she plays a similar role to Mr. X and Lady D, invincibly encountering the player until her dedicated boss fight. She wears removed human skin along with permanent restraints around her wrists and chains on her ankles. Her body has become contorted due to various experiments and testing. Lisa Trevor's backstory is quite a sad one and perfectly portrays how horrific Umbrella truly is. So you know the mansion that you spend the majority of the game in? Wow, what a mansion! Well, in 1964, Lisa Trevor's father, George, Oh my! <laughs> was contracted to design and construct it in the Arclay Mountains just outside the Midwestern town of Raccoon City. George Trevor had developed a reputation for his elaborate architecture and use of hidden rooms and anti-intruder traps. Oswell E. Spencer, or the Umbrella Founder, was able to lure George to the project with the promise of unlimited funding and free reign on creativity. After a three-year construction period, the mansion was finally completed in 1967. Seeing as George Trevor knew all the secrets of the mansion, Umbrella considered him a threat and the loose end that needed tying up. Under the guise of celebration, Spencer personally invited George along with his wife, Jessica, and daughter Lisa to his mansion. Getting caught up in his work, George sent his family to the mansion ahead of him, intending to catch up with them in a few days. At the age of 14, Lisa and her mother arrived at the mansion and were subsequently captured and subjected to experiments with the progenitor virus. George would die later when arriving at the mansion. And that's pretty much where George's story ends. And he says, you have a deep voice. A voice like that must have a big dong below. <laughs> Lisa's reaction to the infection was positive and she developed a slight amount of superhuman strength, while her mother was considered a failure and promptly executed. As Lisa's mind slowly degraded, Umbrella had employees impersonate her mother, attempting to quell Lisa's rage. After five days in captivity, Lisa discovered trickery was afoot and attacked the impersonator. Believing they had stolen her mother's face, she attempted to remove the employee's face to return it to her actual mother. It is unclear whether the Umbrella employee survived this attack. As time passed for Lisa Trevor, she was subjected to numerous tests and viruses, and her existence was only known to a select few within Umbrella. One such test occurred in 1988 where Lisa was selected for her resilience as a host for the Nemesis Alpha Parasite. Yes, that Nemesis. The parasite was meant to replace brain function in BOWs, making them easier to control. Things did not go quite how Umbrella had planned. 
Lisa was resilient to the parasite and her immune system rejected it, thus destroying it. This reaction brought back a fraction of her consciousness, which led to her obsession with faces, women faces especially. By 1995, Umbrella executives eventually lost patience for Lisa's disturbing habits and ordered her to be executed. Lisa again proved her resilience and survived, escaping into the Arclay Mountains. It wasn't until the T-virus outbreak in 1998 where she was able to move back into the mansion and took refuge in the facilities and tunnels where she had mutated so long ago. It was only a matter of time before the members of STARS would encounter Lisa Trevor, and during the encounter, Lisa is reunited with the remains of her mother and leaps into the chasm below. Detailed in the Umbrella Chronicles game, she survives this swan dive into the abyss, encountering Albert Wesker, where she ultimately gets trapped underneath a giant chandelier where Lisa Trevor finally meets her end when the mansion self-destructs. The next major boss fight in the game is against Plant 42. Plant 42 came about from, you guessed it, T-virus experiments on plants. This plant is similar to the one encountered earlier in the mansion, but has grown massively like Rita Repulsa and Lord Zed powering up one of their monsters. Grow! Grow! Monster Grow! <laughs> it has numerous blood-sucking, tentacle-like vines and a big bulb in the middle capable of an acid spit attack. Created by Dr. Henry Sarton in the dormitory building of the Arclay Laboratory, this floral beast began life as a normal decorative plant in the room Point 42, hence the name Plant 42. After being injected with the T-virus, it began to slowly grow in size. As its strong roots pushed between boards and broke through concrete, they found their way down into the aqua ring below the dormitory. The chemical-rich water powered up the roots, allowing Plant 42 to reach its full strength. Soon, the entire dormitory building was under the control of Plant 42, using cracks in the floors and walls to grab passers-by with its blood-sucking vines. Plant 42 had become much too powerful for Umbrella to handle, so a plan was devised to destroy it with a special herbicide called V-Jolt. Unfortunately, it was too late. The aqua ring was now infested with escaped sharks, making it inaccessible and compounded by the fact that most of the researchers were now zombies. Before the fall of the Arclay lab, the Plant 42 research data had made its way to other Umbrella facilities, allowing for more plant-based shenanigans in Raccoon City. Next we have the wasp. These insects are yet another accidental exposure to the T-virus. Once normal wasps living in the dormitory building, they found their way to the monstrosity of Plant 42 and fed on its contaminated pollen. Exposure to the T-virus has resulted in growth nearly 10 times as large as a normal wasp, as well as an extremely potent venom from its massive stinger. Although the T-virus has heightened these wasps' offensive capabilities, it seems to have done very little to improve their defenses when it comes to conventional wasp removal methods. They can fly up to 19 miles per hour, so you'd better book it to avoid getting infected with the T-virus by their stingers. Moving on from insects, we have arachnids. Enter the web spinner. Unlike the giant spiders from RE0, the web spinners are BOWs that were purposely created by Umbrella. We're assuming that's why they get the cool name, as opposed to their RE0 counterparts. Despite their name, web spinners are rarely known to produce webs. This is due to their mutation under the T-virus. With their acidic spitting venom attack, they have no need to capture their prey with their silk. Web spinners will scurry around on walls and ceilings to keep out of view of unsuspecting STARS members. A careful listener will know when a web spinner is around from the thumps produced by their eight legs as they scamper across the surface. Due to their low intelligence, web spinners were deemed too impulsive to be sold as military weapons. Some web spinners will be carrying an egg sac full of baby spiders that will burst out everywhere in the event of their mother's death. These nasty little guys erupt into a vengeful fury toward their mother's killers but are small, all you need to do is step on them. 
Our next boss is the mother of all spiders, Black Tiger. Judging by the amount of baby spiders that come out once you kill it, that title is not just a figure of speech. Unlike the web spinners, Black Tiger does in fact spin webs as it has built a large nest for itself in the caves below the mansion. Due to its impeccable union with the T-Virus, Black Tiger has mutated tremendously in size, along with gaining a significant boost to speed, strength, and spinning distance. The Black Tiger moniker comes from the orange and black stripes that adorn its legs. Due to their instinctual ferocity, the Umbrella Lab in the Arklay Mountains chose great white sharks for their expansion into testing the T-Virus on creatures outside of insects. To the dismay of the researchers, there was no significant change in the aquatic creatures. All the shark test subjects were disposed of except for one female specimen, FI-03. When it was discovered, she was pregnant. She was codenamed Neptune, after the Roman god of the sea. By virtue of being an ovoviviparous fish, the aim was to study the potential for a BOW that would be able to self-fertilize its eggs as a cost-effective means of BOW reproduction. While Neptune inherited the classic T-Virus upgrades in size and aggression, she obviously did not inherit any resistance to electricity. Toasty! The final normal enemy encountered in the game is the Chimera. The Chimera has got to be my favorite enemy that we've covered so far. Their design is raw, and their background is pretty disturbing. Remember how we said that the Hunter Alpha was created through the T-Virus bonding a human embryo to reptilian DNA? Well, the Chimera was one of the first iterations of experimenting with the T-Virus to combine human DNA and the genome of another species. Inspired by the Chimera of Greek mythology, these BOWs were created by mixing fly genes with that of an artificially inseminated human egg. The test subjects were then forced to give birth to these human fly amalgamations. Due to their fly DNA, they age rapidly and reach adulthood within four days of being born. With sharp claws, a chimera is able to latch onto ceilings and walls to get the drop on its prey. Despite the strength of a chimera far exceeding that of a hunter's, they were discontinued due to the T-Virus's classic tendency of destroying the intelligence of the host. They were just too unpredictable for Umbrella to continue researching and developing. The only other time we have seen the Chimera was as a reused asset at the end of the Umbrella Chronicles. And finally, we have come to the penultimate boss in Resident Evil, the Tyrant. As of July 1998, T-002 was the most powerful BOW produced by Umbrella. Not only intended as a weapon, the Secret Tyrant project was based on Umbrella founder Oswald E. Spencer's fascination with eugenics. Something that Wesker clearly shares. The ultimate life form. As experimentation with the T-Virus on human subjects continued to spawn zombie after zombie, it was decided that only individuals at peak physical strength and a natural immunity to the T-Virus would be selected for the Tyrant Project. According to Wesker's report too, in the gene analysis section simulations, only one in 10 million humans would develop as a Tyrant. The rest would merely become zombies. Four prisoners that matched this criteria were chosen with only one surviving and becoming the Tyrant T-002 we all know and love. In my headcanon, one of the other three prisoner test subjects became the Proto-Tyrant from RE0. We've already established that the Tyrant was the most powerful BOW developed by Umbrella at the time, but did it check the other box of being controllable? The answer is yes. Well, controllable by everyone except for Wesker. What? Don't come this way! No! The final test Umbrella needed to do with the Tyrant before mass producing them was to measure its capabilities against veteran soldiers. The outbreak in the Arclay Mountains cut this final check short. One of the most notable physical features on the Tyrant is its exposed heart. While this may seem like a weakness, it is just as durable as anywhere else on its epidermis and is the source of its extreme agility and speed. This enhanced cardiovascular system allows the Tyrant to perform its incredible feats of power and velocity without reducing its endurance. 
It attacks with massive claws which protrude from its left hand, impaling anything that gets in its way. After being dealt significant damage, the tyrant will mutate into a super tyrant. While the transformation isn't as significant as later BOWs in the series, the super tyrant gains a drastic boost in health, physical strength, and movement as well as a reddish tint to the skin. The only thing this tyrant is weak to is a fat old rocket to the face. That'll do it for our lore entry on the BOWs in Resident Evil 1. Hopefully you learned something. If you're here because you like games from Nintendo consoles, you should check out our video on Super Princess Peach. If you're here as a horror fan, check out our video on found footage films. If you want to listen to us joke around and talk about movies, check out our podcast. As always, thank you so much for watching.